Have you ever wondered what would have happened to you if you had made different choices in your life? Where you would end up now? Wonder if there's a place where you made better decisions and had a better life? Maybe the life you always dreamt of? Or have you ever wondered if there are worlds where everything is different? A place where maybe World War II didn't happen, or the Roman Empire never fell? Or maybe the Fruit of the Loom logo had a cornucopia like you remembered? Have you ever dreamt you were in a different world and it felt so real it stuck with you for a long time after waking up? What if I told you it was true? All of it. If you're like me when thinking these questions, my brain wants to say no. But something inside me is telling me it's true. And thus the spark of imagination and wonder takes hold. Some of us, of course, can just move on. But for some of us, it lingers. The world of the Mandela effect leads me to believe that it's not just me, and that a whole bunch of us sense something is going on. Did CERN collapse timelines or worlds, and some of us crossed over to an adjacent world? The Mandela effect is the term to describe a seemingly shared belief of a certain amount of people who believe they remember seeing Nelson Mandela's funeral on TV when he was still very much alive, at least in this timeline. Many of these people can give details of what they saw at the funeral. His crying wife, the crowds, etc. seemed very, very real to these people. Others of these effects seem to focus on logos and tiny things that seem to be changed. While some attribute this to a simulation effect, others attribute to a timeline shift. The many worlds theory can include the simulation theory. This theory does not cancel out the simulation theory. While I touch on this during the video, the simulation theory really deserves its own video. But I may allude to it often in this video like I do in some of my other videos. So let's look at the many worlds theory and what it means conceptually and start from there. There are of course many varying interpretations of the many worlds theory. No one has determined a conclusion. But let's start with what the theoretical physics say about this, as this is where the idea became legitimized. Its foundation stems from the Schrodinger's cat experiment and the attempt to understand quantum mechanics. And the quantum realm is the key to all of this. In quantum mechanics, Schrodinger's cat is a thought experiment that illustrates a paradox of quantum superpositions. In the thought experiment, a hypothetical cat may be considered simultaneously both alive and unalived when it is observed in a closed box as a result of its fate being linked to a random subatomic event that may or may not occur. In the thought experiment, a cat is penned up in a steel chamber along with the following device, which must be secured against direct interference by the cat. In a Geiger counter, there is a tiny bit of radioactive substance, so small that perhaps in the course of the hour, one of the atoms decays but also with equal probability, perhaps none, if it happens, the counter tube discharges and through a relay releases a hammer that shatters a small flask of hydrocanic acid. If one has left the entire system to itself for an hour, one would say that the cat still lives, if meanwhile no atom has decayed. The first atomic decay would have poisoned it. The psi function of the entire system would express this by having it in the living and un unalived cat, pardon the expression mixed or smeared out in equal parts. It is typical in these cases that an indeterminacy originally restricted to the atomic domain becomes transformed into macroscopic indeterminacy, which can then be resolved by direct observation. That prevents us from so naively accepting as a valid, blurred model for representing reality. What is occurring here is the deterministic nature of the observer. This also occurs in the double slit experiment where electrons are directed to two slits on a slide and recorded and measured on another slide on the other side of the slits. When there's no observation, the electrons function as a wave, distributing the electrons in a pattern suggesting a wave. However, as soon as an observer sets to, in to observe this, the wave appears to collapse and the pattern on the wall slide change to reflect them as simply as electrons. This experiment was done in a myriad of ways, including adding the observation after the electrons had reached its destination, and the same effects occurred. This is the kind of thing Einstein referred to as spooky action at a distance. 
In the Copenhagen interpretation, a system stops being a superposition of states and becomes either one or the other when an observation takes place. The Schrodinger's cat thought experiment makes apparent the fact that na the nature of the measurement or observation is not well defined in this interpretation. The experiment can be interpreted to mean that while the box is closed, the system simultaneously exists in a superposition of the states, decayed nucleus slash unalive cat, and undecayed nucleus slash living cat, and that only when the box is open and an observation is performed does the wave function collapse into one of the two states. Niels Bohr offered an interpretation that is independent of a subjective observer-induced collapse of the wave function or of a measurement instead of an irreversible or effectively irreversible process causes the decay of quantum coherence, which imparts the classical behavior of observation or measurement. Thus, Schrodinger's cat would be either unalived or alive long before the box is observed. A resolution of the paradox is that the triggering of the Geiger counter counts as a measurement of the state of the radi radioactive substance. Because a measurement has already occurred, deciding the state of the cat. The subsequent observation by a human records only what has already occurred. Analysis of an actual experiment by Roger Carpenter and A.J. Anderson found that the measurement alone, for example, by a Geiger counter, is sufficient to collapse a quantum wave be function before any human knows the results. The apparatus indicates one of two colors depending on the outcome. The human observer sees which color is indicated, but they don't consciously know which outcome the color represents. A second human, the one who set up the apparatus, is told of the color and becomes conscious of the outcome, and the box is opened to check if the outcome matches. However, it is disputed whether merely observing the color counts as a conscious observation of the outcome. Conscious observation is the key thing here to remember as we go forward. In 1957, Hugh Everett formulated the many worlds interpretations of quantum mechanics, which does not single out observation as a special process. In the many worlds interpretation, both alive and unalived states of the cat persist after the box is opened, but are decoherent from each other. In other words, when the box is opened, the observer and the possibly unalived cat split into an observer looking at a box with, a, with an unalived cat, and an observer looking at a box with a live cat. But since the unalived and alive states are decoherent, there is no effective communication or interaction between them. When opening the box, the observer becomes entangled with the cat, so observer states corresponding to the cats being alive and unalived are formed. Each observer's state is entangled or linked with the cat so that the observation of the cat's state and the cat's state correspond with each other. Quantum decoherence ensures that the different outcomes have no interaction with each other. The same mechanism of quantum decoherence is also important for the interpretation of terms of consistent histories. Only the unalived cat or the live cat can be part of a consistent history in this interpretation. Decoherence is generally considered to prevent simultaneous observation of multiple states. A variant of the Schrodinger's cat experiment known as the quantum suicide machine has been proposed by cosmologist Max Tegmark. It examines the Schrodinger's cat experiment from the point of view of the cat and argues that by using this approach, one may be able to distinguish between the Copenhagen interpretation and the many worlds. Quantum entanglement is the mysterious concept that allows for the possibility of many worlds, as does the rest of the quantum mechanics. As is said, those who claim to understand quantum mechanics don't understand it at all. So we're not here to understand quantum mechanics, but to understand there are things in the quantum realm that lead us to believe in something like many worlds hypothesis. I use the term realm because it is my belief that the quantum realm is another dimension, and I will probably do a video on this concept in the future if people would be interested in it. But it is key in my interpretation of the many worlds hypothesis. In the Schrodinger's concept, there is a belief that there are two parallel universes, one which the box is open and the cat is alive, and one in a parallel world where the box is open and the cat is unalived. I purport there are, is a few others, one where there isn't a cat in the box at all, and one where the thought experiment never took place. Now we have four diverging worlds. You could keep separating them with each possible decision a conscious being or observer makes. In the late 1960s, Bryce DeWitt of the University of North Carolina postulated that every quantum transition taking place in every star in every galaxy in every remote corner of the universe is splitting our local world on Earth into myriad copies of itself. 
David Deutsch argued that when two or more previously identical universes are forced by quantum processes to become distinct, as in the two-slit experiment, there is a temporary interference between the universes, which become suppressed as they evolved. Now this temporary interference is, what if this is consciousness in itself, and what implication and effect does consciousness have on the quantum realm? If we are to believe that there is such a thing as quantum entanglement, where two particles become entangled and no amount of distance will interfere with this entanglement, and the speed of light does not even come into play, that these two entangled particles were ins will instantaneously interact with each other, then we can conclude that it's possible that particles can be entangled in different worlds, on multiple worlds, i.e., either two particles are in a wave function throughout all possible infinite worlds, or there are particles both entangled with particles in our world and other worlds, and particles that exist in our world and all other worlds that are not entangled, but could become entangled. In a 300 qubit quantum computer, which is likely to happen, it would be involving a collaboration between more universes than there are atoms in our visible universe. The idea is that the wave function never actually collapses when we observe it, that there is one superposition of states, one wave function throughout all of existence. Now that sounds a little metaphysical, doesn't it? This is the fascinating part of this theory for me. For it both incorporates ancient wisdom and spirituality of one of consciousness, and the simulation theory that would contain one overruling program that has varied simulations being run on a single program. Though I have a theory on consciousness arriving even in the simulation theory as well, future video to be sure. In this framework of the universal wave function, there can exist many worlds where we don't exist. Certain stars and planets don't, don't exist. But there can be many, many worlds that are like ours, both subtly different and some more extremely different than ours. In this concept, let's look at the direct adjacent world to ours. There is a you who has all the same memories as you up until a point where you diverge, creating new memories for each of you. Each of these states would exist, or should I say, all states just exist. So let's assume the multiple worlds interpretation is correct, and let's take a look at, the, at consciousness as an emergent phenomenon. We have no physical interpretation of consciousness. We have no atoms or quantum function attributed to consciousness. At best, we can infer an effect of consciousness on the quantum realm, and as a result, the physical realm. Let's say I suggest the quantum realm is an underlying dimension of existence. We live in a 3D world, Really, I believe it's possible we live up to five or six dimensions. It's just our conception of these dimensions we don't incorporate into our knowledge base. But let's say we live in a 3D world, and there are infinite other 3D worlds that exist. But the quantum realm also exists in all of them, and are connected to all of them, sometimes entangled, sometimes not. Often possibly interacting with each other. Could be the explanation of ghosts, seeing a close interaction with another entity in a nearby world approaching our world, again, possible full video of this as well in the future. If we believe time is another dimension, debatable, but this too could supersede all other worlds. You'd have two dimensions and inhabit all the other possible worlds in existence and which come into existence. If consciousness is not what we think of, but an emergent dimension in which we all also exist in, like the quantum and time dimensions in all the universes, is it possible that not only do we share a consciousness with each of our doppelgangers, but that they could all be the same consciousness and you may possibly have a chance to inhabit any one you choose, should the ability to choose present itself. This of course depends greatly on my conception of consciousness as not another plane of existence like spirituality says, though it's not far off, but another dimension. But if I'm right, we're, are we actually those of us who are conscious and using the spiritual as a guide to gain higher degree of consciousness, are we not multidimensional beings? What if our liberation from our problems and our bad choices could be that we are not stuck in this one world and our clinging to our problems, emotions, and things in this world is the very thing preventing us from traveling to other worlds that are available to us through the consciousness and quantum dimensions? Perhaps our dream state is where we become untangled to these collapsed superpositions and are free to travel to other worlds. We wake sometimes with memories of these experiences. How often have you had a dream where you were you, but not you, in your house, but it wasn't your house, and things like that. 
What if enlightenment and our liberation is discovering this ability to move between worlds? The beings in that world are you, but not you, but they're you. If the consciousness is a superposition, and let's suppose there isn't one consciousness, but one for each of us, then you wouldn't be supplanting an individual. You would just be inhabiting a new body and a new life in a new world. If there is a shared consciousness or one consciousness, it's possible you could swap your life for any other life on another world. Or maybe it's that our consciousness has the ability to entangle itself to other worlds. And that is the way we can move between worlds. What if the soulmate phenomena is two people becoming entangled on another world? And when you encounter that person, you are entangled already. You can't explain the feeling, but it's there because your consciousness has quantumly entangled you together. Albeit on a different world and you're completely unaware of it. And if you could do that to one entity or world, you, could you do that for other worlds? What if the conscious decision making is where you and another version of you then become unentangled, and thus the divergence? So you cannot alter reality, but it's possible you could move to a different reality of your choosing, or keep sliding through each adjacent reality till you found an optimal one. In many cases, you probably wouldn't even know that you slipped into another world, that they'd be so similar that you wouldn't notice. How would you feel with this power? Would it make you feel uncomfortable to move to a subtly different world? And what if we do already? What if we naturally do unconsciously and our choices make us inhabit these worlds that we created and we feel stuck in them, unbeknownst to us that we can slide into a new one just as easily? If we do, it would explain the Mandela effect, wouldn't it? Or the strange memories where you were sure the shirt you bought was blue, but when you wake up and put it on the next day, it's black or white. The stories of people shifting into strange alternate realities may be cases where people jump to non-adjacent or nearby worlds, to ones that are extremely different, creating a feedback loop to one's own consciousness of revulsion and fear, and an anchor rips them back to their previous world. In Buddhism it is said that life is suffering and attachments are what lead to suffering. The goal is to be enlightened and to ascend to a higher plane. To escape suffering, one must reach the ability to move freely between worlds for optimal benefit to one's goals and soul. Perhaps our attachments are what keep us locked in our current world. Like an anchor, holding us to situations that we'd rather not be in. Well, now it's time for you to tell me what you think. Let me know in the comments below. Please share and like this video. And please subscribe. And thank you so much for listening to and watching this video. Have a good one.